I'm Chris Holland, Editor-in-Chief of Field Service News, and I'm delighted to bring you the second excerpt of our recent webcast that we put together looking at the changing face of the Field Service Engineer. The webcast was looking at research we undertook with ServiceMax, a GE digital product, and we are exploring in the webcast a number of the trends, insights and findings of the research. I was joined by Kieran Notter, Director of Global Customer Transformation for ServiceMax, and in this part of the webcast, we were discussing the skill sets of the field service engineer of the future. As we look at the next stage of the research then, having established that the aging workforce crisis is indeed an actual crisis, bringing in a steady stream of the best and the brightest new field service engineers should of course be a very real and very major focus for most field service organizations. But as you've just mentioned here, you know, we live in a world of connected customers, we live in a world of digitalization, um, we live in a world where perhaps customer expectations, because of companies like Uber or Amazon in our consumer lives, um, expectations for our service are bigger than they've ever been before. So what does that actually mean for the, the field service engineer in the future? So we wanted to drill down in the research to find out what companies were looking for. Now the first point that we looked at here was the level of education. And I mentioned at the top, you know, we, we kind of at Field Service News view uh, Field Service very much as a horizontal focus with, with you know, maybe 80, 85 percent, sometimes even 90 percent of the main points being shared across different verticals. Um, perhaps this is one area where there are specific vertical nuances. Let's take Electra, go back to Electra for an example. I'm sure that there'll be a focus when they're looking at um, bringing in engineers because of the industry that they serve um, on STEM based degrees. However, when we kind of take a step away and look at the broader picture, for me there were a couple of really interesting things in this slide um, and this piece of the, the, the research. I thought it was really interesting that more companies are looking at practical qualifications, um, almost twice as many companies look at practical qualifications than generic degrees. And an equally large amount of organizations, around a third of those, are looking at taking each case on its merits. I think this is absolutely vital um, when we're looking at the need for a consistent, steady stream of bringing in engineers, um, attracting engineers, not just to our organizations, but to our sector as a whole. Um, that's not to say that we should discount you know, higher education at all, but I think let's, the, the fact that it's, um, many companies now, no longer having it as a, a mandatory tick box exercise and actually looking at the merits is very, very important and I think that's, that's going to be something that will be seen much more as we move forwards. But let's have a little look at actually what the three most important skills for a field service engineer are. Now technical engineering skills of course are going to be important. A technical engineering role, it, it, you know, is a field service role. Field service roles are. There, there is a need for technical skills. That's never going to go away, and we see that there. Seventy percent of the respondents just over um, stating that technical engineering skills are important. And I think that will be across almost all sectors. Um, what's interesting for me is the soft skills. Just shy of half of the respondents and they're stating that soft skills, people skills are vitally important. Um, this kind of goes back to this point I made at the, at the beginning of this, this section when we talk about the connected customer, the customer that is um, educated and ingrained in, into you know, what they expect from good service, the transparency that automation allows as well. Um, more and more as well in the digital world, quite often the engineer is perhaps the only human one-to-one -one interaction we have. Um, and they're going in in a situation, let's be honest, they're going into nine times out of ten still uh, on a traditional break fix or even if it's preventative maintenance, they're going in to make sure that the customer is getting the uptime, they're getting the, the output that they've, they, they've basically invested in the organization for. So they're going in as a real true brand ambassador. It's interesting to see that these soft skills have really come to the fore. Um, I just want to go back to uh, what you were saying a little bit about the triage and the, uh, in that digital toolkit, you know, the contact center, like Alexa, uh, Alexa kind of being able to remotely fix about 40% of the issues. Of course, the flip side of that, that challenge is um, that when the engineer is actually sent out, quite often it's an escalation, that quite often the automated processes have perhaps not quite been able to create the diagnosis. So the engineer going out 
is going up because a truck roll is the most expensive thing on most field service organisations P and L. So they're being sent out to provide that fix and to be able to do that as a first time fix is great for again it's a win win because there's less cost and the customer's happier. So it's really interesting to see proactive problem solving come right up to the top there as well. You know, it, it's something that really kind of does bring to the fore the importance of the engineer. I think the engineer's role is, as we move more and more to a world of sanitization, outcome-based services, of digitalization, the engineer's becoming more and more important. I mean, self-diagnosis is something that's a real interesting facet. And, and Kieran, I know you guys have done some stuff around kind of the, the soft skills and self-diagnosis and the customers being able to kind of look at these elements. Um, how important is it, these, these softer skills, and then the, the engineer being able to go in and talk to a, a customer that's, that's perhaps gone through that process of self-diagnosis or that has gone through the triage stage and then the engineer sent out on site. Uh, well, Chris, I think it, it's really interesting because obviously if you're, if you're a technician, right, yeah. you're going to have technical skills, whether you get them through, through academia or whether you get them through experience at other companies. But one of the things that's never guaranteed is mm -hmm. the soft skills. Yeah. Okay, so, so if you look at you know, soft skills, gone are the days where a technician used to sort of sneak in, fix the machine, and then they go. And as you said, they are, they are the face of the brand now. Absolutely. You know? and, and again, it's not very often that a technician will turn up at a customer and a customer's, customer's actually pleased to see them because their machine's running fantastically. They're there to fix a problem. Mm -hmm. you know, that is what yeah. they're known as. But there is a huge importance to the customer satisfaction. The, the School of Economics done a, did a study, the London School of Economics did a study and associated that every 7% increase in NPS, customer mm -hmm. satisfaction, that you get correlates to 1% of revenue, which okay. is quite an important thing. Yeah. Right? And, and again, I mean, the association between a fault on a machine and a technician. Mm -hmm. right? They associated, when you saw a technician, it meant the machine wasn't working. Yeah. Soft skills help you create that, that persona of the technician that's no longer just there to fix problems. It's there yeah. to increase your output, if you like, in, in better your experience with the product, mm. with everything else that goes along with it. So those days are gone. And then with the tools that we have now, with like predictive analytics and that, often the technician turns up before the machine's broken. Mm. So it really breaks that association. And then there's a second piece, you know, like people often say, should technicians sell? Yeah. Yeah, personally speaking, I think technicians sell every time they're okay. there. The, possibly the question could be, should a technician do the commercials? Mm, okay. Yeah. Right? So if you look at a sales guy, a sales guy turns up, let's just say the average life of that machine is 15 years. Sales guy sells on the machine, comes back 14 years later to discuss the next sale for the next mm. 15 years. Technician's there every however often, depending on how reliable the machine is, how often the PM is. So he is the contact point. So they're already in there. And then... The other question would be, if a sales guy comes to you and says, no offense to sales people if there's any on the call, but <laughs> if a sales guy comes to, to you and says, like, you need to have one of these, yeah. right? is there an ulterior motive? Why is he telling me that? If a technician comes to you and says, like, I'd advise you get one of these, you're going to be far more inclined to trust him and understand that you're going to get that for your own benefit because he is the trusted the advisor. They are the people yeah. that look after the machine and therefore look after you. So it is, it is quite a... It's quite a big link to get to that, that soft skills. And as you can see from your study, there is a huge increase Absolutely. compared to if you'd have done this three years ago. Yes. And people are investing, companies are investing in soft skills training now as much as any other type of training they have. Yeah. And then, you know, with the soft skills, you need to understand what the technician needs. You know, what does the technician of the future need? So a lot of people go through their, their, their IT department to get all these new tools, etc. But one of the biggest things that we see and we now advise our customers to do is, is actually ask the technicians what would they yeah. wish to be. Yeah, it's a great way of selling and getting adoption for, for new products that you put into the market but it's also a great way of understanding which pieces of tools that, that would best suit them and best benefit them. So interestingly one of the biggest things that we saw uh, and I do struggle to say this word but calibration right, is one of the yeah. biggest is one of the biggest things that the, the technicians mm. required. It's not just calibration on understanding how to fix a machine or what the problem is. It's calibration to understand which company they belong to. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, an old phrase that says about the technician going native. Yeah. So, so you don't want the technician to think they work for the customer. Mm. They want to serve the customer, but they have to remember they work for you. And you're only going to do that by getting calibration. Yeah. And then, of course, with the rest of that, you get everything else that comes with it. If you've got a tool that you can, you can work and get calibration, you get that 
that older, more experienced, so I shouldn't say older, but the more experienced technician to be able to share the information with the newer technician that, that doesn't have experience. Yes. And you can move through those. So, so you start to feel part of a team, you get that knowledge from everybody else, and you can really understand what you're doing. You could also turn up on site knowing everything that's gone before you. So you don't go in there blind anymore. You already know the last five, ten calls. You know the last technician that went in there. You can understand the last problem. So you understand what sort of reception you're going to get. Yeah. And those are the type of tools that a technician really wants to have. And then aside from other things, they don't want to carry a thousand page manuals around with them. Who wants to do that? You've got you know that knowledge base there. You've got service manuals. Everything's at your fingertip when it's this time. Yeah. You can just choose it. Go to the point that's relevant to you. And, and that's you know that's that's how we work through that that wish list, yeah. and, and advise technicians to to advise the business on what to do and how to get it. It's interesting actually that you advise that. It's something that we did in a previous piece of research. We kind of asked our our, our companies how our responses, how many actually do this, go through this process. It's, it's drawn up in bound for a long time to get the end users in, um, and only a, a small selection, about thirty three percent, actually did it. But of those ninety percent, I think it was ninety six percent said that they got quicker onboarding times by doing so. And that brings us to the end of this second excerpt from the excellent webcast that we recorded with Kieran Notter of ServiceMax AGE Digital Product. If you would like to download the full webcast, it is available for Field Service News subscribers. Click the link below for subscription details. There's also a white paper that was written exclusively based around these findings. And again, that's available for Field Service News subscribers, and you'll find the links below. But for now, thanks so much for taking the time to listen. We hope you have a fantastic day and we'll see you again soon. Take care.